Good morning, everybody. Um, just so you know, we're uh, in a session here and we're mainly doing this for the archive that is going to be coming up. So uh, welcome. Uh, you've got, uh, at least on my bottom, because um, I've got the side thing going on here in Zoom, um, I've got our, our lead author, uh, Joel Nagel from the University of Windsor. Uh, I'm in the middle. So actually, we're kind of reversed ordered on my Zoom. Um, and then my colleague, Randy Labonte, is just above me here. And um, although I guess for you guys, they're going to be going across when you watch the archive. Uh, this is actually looking at a research project that we've been working on now for uh, the past year and a half, where we've been essentially trying to document what has been happening in Canada during the pandemic when it comes to uh, remote teaching and remote learning. Uh, so if you go ahead there, Joel. Over the course of that time, we've actually thus far produced four reports. We're actually working on the fifth one now. And the idea behind them essentially was that, and they're a little bit out of sequence in terms of when they were published. So the last one that was published, but the one that was intended to be the first part of the series, uh, the one in the gray there, really is sort of defining the differences between um, remote teaching emergency remote teaching and online teaching or online learning uh, so that you can get a sense of the differentiation because uh, Canny Learn Partners uh, actually was Randy and myself um, on a project and Joel was one of the authors of that this year uh, in the 14th edition, uh, a report that looks at online learning annually. Um, but this really isn't online learning annually in the same way that it has been in, in traditional years. So that's why we wanted these separate reports. So the first report that we actually published was the green one there, documenting triage, which looks at the essentially what happened during the spring of 2020 when we were sort of all shut down, at least initially, and how things came back to, to be. Uh, the orange one, which was the second one that was published, looked at essentially how everyone opened up in the fall of the 2020-21 school year and the preparations that were made and the plans in place for that fall opening. Um, around Christmas, and you can sort of see, you know, the green, orange, and red, spring, fall, Christmas. Um, at Christmas time, we published the, the red one, which essentially was a series of stories written by students, parents, teachers, uh, administrators, school leaders, district leaders, school board folks uh, that looked at essentially what had happened for the previous, I guess at that point, it was eight months from their perspective and, and what they saw as some of the um, wins, if you will, and as well, some of the challenges that we were still facing. And we're currently working on a fifth report, which I think Joel will talk about at the end, which is basically looking at this school year, and she may be able to tease that out a bit. Uh, so if we go ahead there, Joel. Um, so I just want to sort of contrast two things, and these are quotes that come from our gray um, report, so the, the pandemic pedagogy report, which was essentially a K-12 version of what Chuck Hodges and his team had done uh, with the um, an Educause review article that they published in March of last year. And uh, we brought in a few additional authors into that uh, to really flesh out the K-12 aspect of it. But they contrasted online learning and what they described as emergency remote teaching. And um, while I'm not gonna read the definition to you here, you can uh, get that on your own or you can check it out in the report, but I will point out some of the, what I consider key terms, things like purposeful, systematic, careful consideration, uh, determining which are the best suited, looking at strengths and limitations, again, careful planning, appropriately trained, um, you know, so it's a really, a, you know, this is something that you sit down and think about for a long period of time. Um, you know, you, you sort of plan it out in a meticulous way, and it gets implemented in that manner. Uh, moving ahead, Joel. Contrasting that with can you, oh, there we go. Contrasting that with emergency remote teaching as they describe it, you know, and again, I won't read the definition to you, but you can see some of the key terms there, that it's a temporary shift uh, and it's only due to the crisis circumstances that it is um, 
um, that once the crisis or emergency has abated, we'll go back to what we always did. It's, it's not designed to recreate a robust educational ecosystem, um, but it's designed to be temporary and it's quick to set up, but still hopefully, and I use the term hopefully, they're very um, hopeful, although that wasn't that hopeful throughout most of the pandemic, reliable in that nature. I'll go ahead, Joel. So if you look at sort of what should have been happening over the past year and a bit, um, Phil Hill created this, this I think, wonderful graphic. Um, at, uh, and basically, if you're looking at it, phase one in his mind was essentially March and April of 2020. You know, we shut down, we quickly just moved to Zoom school, and that was sort of how we did things. And... Then throughout the spring, as people got a little bit used to this, started to learn the tools a bit, we started to add in things that um, allowed us to do some of the things that we used to do in the classroom, but be able to do them in a remote context. And then phase three was supposed to be this school year, where we had planned for us to sort of toggle back and forth between sometimes being in the classroom, sometimes being online, sometimes being a combination of the two and some hybrid or concurrent kind of model. And then hopefully um, this coming fall or though maybe next fall, depending upon uh, how things roll out, that will emerge into this new normal uh, as we go forward. Um, so this is sort of what was supposed to happen. Now, I think one of the things that you'll see as you listen to the Canadian experience, some jurisdictions were smoother than others and closer than others in doing this, but in many cases, it wasn't sort of as smooth as this uh, image implies. So I'll turn it over to my colleague, Joelle, and she'll take it from there. Thank you, Mike. So these are just some of the, the dates that happened um, when everybody shut down last spring. So most of the, the shutdowns happened um, or coincided with the spring break. And so we had that spring break and then schools were shut down, um, continuing from that and never went back, except for a couple of jurisdictions later um, in June. But if you take a look at the dates, you can see that a lot of the jurisdictions really did um, kind of move or set up online places online where teachers and students and parents could go um, to get support for curriculum and um, research for mental health and those kinds of things. So fairly quickly, um, relatively, I suppose, devices were delivered to students in most of the jurisdictions. Um, what happened usually at a local level, particularly thinking about Ontario, is that the school boards then reached out to students that needed devices and any of the devices that they had across their schools, they would locate them and distribute them to students who didn't have access. And only New Brunswick and Ontario also offered connectivity to the internet as well. So the technology that was offered to students were iPads and tablets, but also laptops and Chromebooks. And um, that was sort of a way to kind of address any um, equity issues in terms of getting these um, students to go online. But of course, that wasn't always um, available across all jurisdictions. So for those students that just couldn't have access to, I'm so sorry, couldn't have access to um, digital devices or just did not have access to the internet, thinking about our northern communities, particularly learning packages were created and sent out to students. So they could range from um, curriculum packages to books to even some supplies in some cases. And while not all of the ministries across the jurisdictions offered this um, as something, a, a province-wide initiative at the local level, there were school boards that took the initiative to make sure that students who couldn't get online had what they needed available. And then in some jurisdictions like Nova Scotia and the Northwest Territories, they also partnered um, with other organizations within their community. For example, in Nova Scotia, their newspaper to distribute um, packages and then within the Northwest Territories, they partnered with their radio station so that they could broadcast, um, for example, storytelling initiatives for their students. So most all jurisdictions either created separate 
um, websites, learning websites for their um, for their provinces or territories, um, and then others just created pages within their ministry websites. So on these websites, you would have links to curriculum for grade, for language, math, for, for all of your subjects. You would also have links for families for mental health um, so that um, the parents had what they kind of needed, you know, in a space um, to support their students through their remote teaching and learning. So there were a lot of synchronous tools used. There wasn't like a standard one, even across any one jurisdiction. It was more um, what each board or district had chosen for their schools. And there was also a variety of organizational tools, for example, Google Classroom and learning, learning management systems. And then also, um, for example, Ontario and Quebec, they offered um, professional learning for their educators through these websites, or some jurisdictions offered a broader access to like LinkedIn Learning or ProQuest. But it's with the understanding that these professional learning opportunities weren't necessarily broadcast widely so that all teachers were engaging in these. It was sort of if, you know, you kind of went and searched for, for these and found them. But then again, it's also um, finding the time to sort of um, acclimatize to this emergency remote situation and figure all of that out with your students and then kind of um, reach out perhaps to um, other venues of helping support you as a teacher. And so again, there were some um, access to professional learning, uh, webinars, um, some jurisdictions offered university courses, how-to tutorials in terms of how to use your learning management systems or going synchronous with your tools, toolkits, those kinds of things and access to curriculum supports. Um, but again, that would be something that um, a teacher would have to go and seek out. It wasn't necessarily um, something that was made known to everyone. And then at the, the board level, um, from my own experience with my husband who's teaching in Ontario, that was just the focus was mostly on how do we even get our students engaged um, during this, this crisis pandemic time. So with the, the spring and being very chaotic and, and very stressful, um, moving into September, thinking about what, where are we going to be all of the jurisdictions in Canada um, opened up. Um, there were some delays depending on numbers. For example, in Ontario, um, there was a delay just because school boards weren't really sure um, how they were um, being sort of instructed by the ministry to set up these classes. So there was a two week delay, staggered starts, just like there was a staggered start in Saskatchewan and um, a two day delay in British Columbia, just because at that time, um, some of their, their numbers were changing in terms of COVID cases. And so um, they had that quick delay, but for across all the jurisdictions, everybody was starting in school at the time. Now there were also virtual schools that were set up for students um, that wanted to continue to be remote. And those had, for example, in Ontario, separate teachers, separate schools, the students were still um, located, what? you know, virtually with another, with their home school, but they had separate teachers in schools and a separate principal that was um, instructing and coordinating those virtual schools. So with our, our moving into face-to-face -face in the fall, there were lots of enhanced health measures, um, lots of physical distancing, there were masks, at the beginning, um, for most jurisdictions, masks were from grade four and up. And then as um, COVID numbers changed and as things changed, then masks became mandatory yes. in a lot of places for all grades. So for remote learning, um, there were you know, different um, expectations and different initiatives. Some students, like I mentioned, continue to live, um, work remotely and had their own schedule and pacing for curriculum while others were um, in class. For the high schools, um, quadmesters were adopted where students, instead of taking four courses in a semester, 
for two months, they would do two courses and they would alternate weeks. They would go to school. They would go to school in the, in the morning and then go online in the afternoon and then vice versa. But when they were home, um, it was a hybrid model where they would be um, in the meet and watching their, their other cohort students in the classroom with the teacher. So thinking about student experiences, teacher experiences, administrator experiences, and understanding that um, it's very important to have those um, voices and experiences within all of these kind of decisions that ministries made and districts made and, and communities made to make it um, really more visible how stressful and chaotic it was. So for students um, in our report where we talked about um, individual stories, there was a lot of procrastination, there was a lot of isolation, there was a lot of things to do and do independently. So as Mike mentioned in the beginning, there's this big difference between a regular planned um, pedagogically sound kind of online learning idea, but then when you are um, in emergency re remote learning, there is a lot of things there that um, need to be considered in particular, students really needed to be a lot more um, self-regulated and independent in those situations, which was very challenging. And so then at some times it was too fast and then for, you know, sometimes it's too slow. Um, and it was very difficult for a lot of students to become really engaged in that space. And of course, you know, they're not with their friends. Um, there's a lot of uh, teacher directed learning in, in those kinds of things, which make it difficult. And then on the other side for teachers as well, it's extremely difficult. Um, a lot of teachers, depending on whether there was, they were in lockdown in their communities, a lot of teachers would be home um, teaching at the same time as that they're trying to manage or navigate their, their children at home, which becomes very difficult. Um, it's very difficult when students don't have access to technology. So at the local level, a lot of teachers took the initiative to um, create printed materials and deliver them to their students. And of course, it was just, it's very difficult um, navigating the different announcements and the different kind of protocols that needed to be in place because it seemed that throughout this school year in the fall, as well as this winter and spring, there's a lot of, of different messages going on and a lot of different things happening in various parts of each jurisdiction. And then of course, for our, our school leaders, our administrators, um, they're the ones that have to be managing all of this. And it was just really important that they, um, you know, be nimble and alert and, and be on top of getting students resources, making sure that everybody's informed and connected. Um, so this idea, you know, that you're supposed to, to pivot, it's now, I feel like the dreaded word through all this is pivoting and making sure that everything um, is going smoothly. So I think these personal stories um, that we collected with um, the reports kind of really give you an understanding and a more fulsome idea of really the complexity and the difficulty and the challenge that the emergency remote learning created. So then of course, moving in further into this new school year, towards the end of the fall and, and into the winter, our numbers in Canada, across Canada, started to, to increase significantly again. And so while our many jurisdictions still offered the choice of the virtual school, um, they continued to open it up so, so teachers, sorry, so parents could switch if they were in school, they could switch to the virtual schools um, as a learning mode option if they felt that the numbers were too much and, and they were getting a little bit concerned. But by then, by December and into the new year, most every jurisdiction had at least a province-wide lockdown where all schools were shut down at the same time. Or, um, for example, in Ontario, instead of shutting down schools initially, um, we did it after the break, but then opening up, then it was this idea of hot zones where instead of having the full province closed, you would have just hot zones that were restricted and schools were closed. For example, 
Um, one of our largest um, urban areas is Toronto. And so for while everybody was back in school, those so um, schools were closed. And so then throughout the spring and the winter, a lot of jurisdictions left it to their, their local school communities. So if they had cases in their school, um, either a cohort, so a class would be dismissed for two weeks or an entire school would be dismissed for two weeks instead of closing the entire region. So Ontario, for example, went back to online learning again in April and were remaining closed for the rest of the school year. Other jurisdictions, for example, Nova Scotia, they were in person up until May. Then all of a sudden, due to the variants, a spike in cases, they closed all the schools to go online with one day notice. And about a week after they um, announced that they were, they were going to be online for the rest of the year, with eight days left in the school year, they returned to um, uh, in-school learning. And so then they had to make the change again, which was quite difficult. So thinking about what the differences were between the spring and this new school year when students engaged in emergency remote learning. So in the spring, there were very loose expectations for attendance. A lot of the curriculum was peeled back so that you could just be focusing on language and mathematics and science. Um, there were no requirements for synchronous. Um, the expectation was for a lot of asynchronous work. Um, exams were cancelled. Report cards remained um, the way that they were going into the pandemic and nothing changed. The huge difference now is that when students went into online learning or emergency remote learning and any time this year, the expectations for continuing with a the same kind of school year remained. So we had regular attendance. There were assessments continued as normal. Report cards were still delivered at the end of the year or each term. There was still a full curriculum that was being delivered and a blend of synchronous and asynchronous. And two examples that I have are in Ontario. So our school day is 300 minutes of learning a day. And the ministry mandated that that still continue even if we're online. So each grade level had a minimum um, amount of synchronous learning that had to happen throughout the day. And then the time away from that was work done asynchronously. And for example, in Alberta, they did the same, but thinking more like within a, in a week, um, students have to have so much synchronous work a week and then um, added on extra hours for different um, curricular expectations. So whereas the spring last year, it was much more open, um, much more kind of understanding of the stress and the, the challenges doing remote learning for this year is sort of like, for lack of a better word, like a business as usual kind of model where we're just going to do whatever we do in the classroom, but we're gonna do it online. And that's not necessarily with offering targeted professional learning or development for teachers on really how to do this in a different way than they did in the spring. And so we'll be reporting in our next report on really across across Canada, what exactly kind of um, that remote learning looked like for each of the jurisdictions. And of course, you can visit our website so that you can access all of our, our reports. Thank you very much. Thanks, Joelle. <laughs> and it's Randy Labonte here as well. And in the text chat for those watching the archive as well are links to where you can find all the documents and information as well, uh, the link to the PDF is a master link, which has got everything uh, listed there. So thanks for your attention. And uh, hopefully uh, if you have any questions as well, the contact information we can uh, is on the document as well, but let's type in our email addresses into the text chat here, which will be on the recording for anyone else that wants to get in touch with us. Thank you, Michael. Joel, do you want to put yours in as well? Yeah. So we have no one in attendance, so we have no questions. Michael, anything else to add? Not that I can think of. Um, 
you know, I, I think we've essentially gone through looking at um, what we've largely seen at least up until Christmas. And Joel's done a little bit there to tease out what's going to be coming in the, the, the coming report. I mean, I think the main thing that I look at, um, you know, being the, the one that's based in the U.S. right now is that what we've seen really are, you know, across the board for the most part in Canada and the U.S. are four specific models. You know, we, we've got one model where kids are just in the class like normal, maybe with some, um, you know, pandemic, social distancing, those kinds of things. We've seen one model where the schools are closed and we try to do everything remotely. And then there's two sort of in-between models. One where you've got um, students are coming to school some days and then learning online during the other days. And then the, the third model or the fourth model, which is similar to that, is they come to school some days and learn from the teacher in front of them. And some days they sit at home and learn from the teacher in front of them through an environment like this where the teacher is concurrently teaching. Um, so, you know, those two sort of split ones, you've got one that's a true hybrid one where they're either learning online or learning in the classroom. Um, and then the other one is essentially you've got this concurrent teaching going on where I'm trying to teach in the room and online at the same time. And those are the four models we've seen really all throughout North America. And that's sort of what we've uh, experienced across Canada. So, um, you know, not anything sort of unique and, and wonderful that we can pass on to our American colleagues to say, hey, we've got the answer, because um, we usually do. <laughs> <laughs> and of, of those models, is there any information or research to s indicate which are successful, which have challenges, um, and any preferences or recommendations? From the research, um, from the research during the pandemic, there it, you know it's too new for for that to come out yet. I can tell you from what we knew about best practices beforehand. Um, of those models that I've just listed, there's, you know, three that are, three that we know something about and one that we know nothing about other than the fact that um, our schools and teachers aren't equipped to do it. And that's that last one, that concurrent teaching one. Um, you know, the idea that I could have some kids here in front of me and some kids here in the room like this, and that I'm going to teach them all at the same time giving them an equitable amount of attention, having them have meaningful interactions with each other, not just in the environment that they're in, but between the two environments. And I'm somehow going to do that all with a single classroom computer that I also have to use to teach the lesson with no additional audio equipment or video equipment that's set up in the room whatsoever to facilitate both my instruction as well as the students' interaction with each other. I mean, whatever idiot came up with that idea, um, you know, I, I've got some wonderful oceanfront property in Saskatchewan that I would love to sell you. <laughs> I think that sort of summarizes your comments from this morning as well uh, in the panel. That was uh, in an in-person one as well. So, um, Joelle, any final comments? Um, no, other than um, I wasn't sure whether you could hear my son in the background. <laughs> he was yep, Michael I, put a comment in the text chat as well. So. Oh, sorry. I, I made yes. the comment that I think he was in his industrial arts class today. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's um, it's just it's very challenging. And having um, um, a student, uh, my son in high school who was doing that hybrid model, it was very challenging. And it's I, I, I can see the teachers really struggling. My husband's a teacher, really struggling to engage students. And it's very challenging. And, and I, I just, I had hoped that, you know, going into this new school year that there would have been very targeted PD in like, let's bring people in, let's, you know, do this and show teachers um, some ideas about what can make this maybe less challenging. But um, I feel like they were just left on their own, just like they were in the spring. And, and for the group, if anyone's watching in the archive, uh, I would like to push back to DLAC itself by saying, because they ran some hybrid sessions and I'm wondering how the level of engagement uh, and what the feedback from the participants who were online would be, 
but also for the presenters uh, who were probably largely focused into the uh, into those in front of them. And Mia, I see you've jumped in. Welcome here. We're just actually wound up our formal presentation. You can catch the archive, but as well, just because uh, you can find everything uh, in a link in a document uh, that we have, and I'll put it in the text chat. It's also in Pathable. 